राघवेंद्र सर एम आई ऑडिबल टू यू हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून सर इज इट ऑडिबल यस यू आर ऑडिबल एंड योर स्क्रीन आल्सो वी कैन सी कैन कैन आई सी दिस स्लाइड इफ यू हैव am i audible sir yes you are audible oh, okay okay and there was some uh, uh, some hiccups in the audio hmm. so so can i go ahead and uh... so that's a ppt right so you'll go one by one to the ppt is it yes sir Yes, okay. yes. So, so before we go forward, I think everything is perfect. I'll make you the presenter once again. But okay. Uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce you. So please wait okay. a while. So, okay. <clears throat> first of all, uh, let me share. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. A uh, very good afternoon. Welcome to all the participants in our Talk to Expert program. Before we move forward for the today's program, I would like to brief about ISTEM. ISTEM is a Indian Science, Technology, and Engineering facility map. It's a national program of Government of India for shaping the R&D infrastructure and supports academia and industry to achieve the goal of making the Bharat. it holds a database of functioning r&d equipment and facilities from government or private funding with options to researchers check the availability and operational status of geographically dispersed facilities and reserve the most suitable one online in paper use through the portal digital catalog on icm portal is available with 700 plus technology products as mandated by empower technology group to help academia and industry to decide the best area and use the available indigenous technology products to manufacture the required infrastructure for the society i think is trying to create the pool of skill mentor and the job opportunity for them in scientific establishment today we have uh, with us mr raghavendra swami h and uh, he is a core computer professional having over 20 years of rich and insightful experience initially of education and later of it sector he has worked across the software development enhancement and support of system software on mainframes hpc servers client embedded segments targeted towards both non heterogeneous and heterogeneous computing environments he is currently pursuing phd from department of computer science and engineering from christ university bangalore in emerging field of heterogeneous system architecture compiler backend optimization he has completed ge from Dr. Ambedkar Institute of Technology, Bangalore, and Master's from University of Wisconsin College of Engineering, Bangalore. He has worked in AMD India Private Limited for about five years, during 2009 and 2014, as a member of technical staff. He was the MTF. He has also worked in Unisys India Private Limited, Bangalore, as a lead engineer during 2005 to 2009. He has founded Automata Research Laboratory. in bangalore in 2015 which is a pure research organization and currently focusing on design and development of microprocessors using optical computing model which uses light for computation and compilers software stack optimization of hot spots in supercomputing area he has filed multiple patents in his career first patent he has filed for a new model and approach in the emerging area at amd second patent he has filed on optical computing engine microprocessor and third one was on was filed on iot device security so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, agwendra swami h on on a talk titled supercomputing using 
GP GPU and OpenCL on heterogeneous computing platform. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, and the argument is on me. It is over to you now. Oh. Yeah. Please share your slides once again. Okay. Is it visible, sir? Not yet. Can you? Uh, yeah, I'll share it. Yeah. yeah, I'll share it. Share it. One more time. Okay. I hope that is 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 it visible now? Yeah, 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 perfect. It is coming perfect. You can just hide this. There is the option of hiding. Can yes, you just see? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Click it, hide. Yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Raghavan Swami. Thank you very much once again. I think you uh, just got disappeared again. Can you again? Yeah. Show? yeah. Share. No, you are already sharing your screen. Now you have to open your PPT. That's it. Yeah, perfect. We, we can see it now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Raghavendra, from Automata Research Laboratory. Today, I will be walking through the one of the uh, prime areas that uh, pretty much every walk of research, every area of research. Is, is covered. Basically, without this, uh, the uh, pretty much uh, the research becomes incomplete. Uh, so, Dr. Akhanda, can you please uh, change the location of your camera because we can only see your hair. Oh, uh, is it? Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, now good. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, basically, uh, what I, yeah, thank you, sir. So basically, what I was uh, mentioning was the uh, uh, supercomputing uh, is one of the uh, or the high performance computing, supercomputing uh, is uh, one of the areas which is uh, touched by every walk of research. So every research area, be it a biotech area, be it a nuclear physics, weather forecasting, deep space research, or uh, drug discovery, or any kind of uh, research for that matter. This uh, is one of the uh, you know, supercomputing or the high performance computing is one of the uh, the prime uh, or the the, uh, the accelerating unit for the work. It accelerates the work and it also reduces the, the cost of you know, the research. So in both the ways, this is actually useful. So I'm just today, the title is supercomputing using GP, GPU and OpenCL on heterogeneous computing platform. So I'll, so the discussion will be supercomputing components moving from workstation, that desktop, laptop and mobile computing acceleration. So OpenCL uh, uh, platform model, uh, then OpenCL uh, device architecture and memory scopes OpenCL memory alignment and process model and a simple uh, APIs are available and the supercomputing area examples and a walkthrough how to identify the supercomputing opportunities. So in the meantime, also I'll put across as and when there is a real time applications and usage and how this can be utilized by the researchers. Basically the intent of this uh, uh, the presentation is to make sure that you know the, the researchers actually can benefit by using uh, this kind of computation so that they can reduce the time and effort uh, in completing their uh, you know, targets. 
of uh, in the process of doing research. So uh, there is some uh, results, uh, final takeaway, conclusion, QA. This is what we are going to do. So supercomputing, uh, basically, uh, as the name says, that super everybody knows supercomputer. It means it's like the pinnacle of the computing and uh, uh, machines, which can churn out, you know, uh, peta flops of uh, computing uh, per second. So now, uh, the uh, the the very need of this kind of uh, this speed, the computation uh, requirement is so. For example, I'm just giving the example. Then I'll go to the one of the simple example is you have, for example, weather forecasting. So weather forecast, everybody knows that. Okay, if you take a weather forecasting, uh, you know, TV report, so they will be forecasting for uh, maybe next seven days, ten days. So my question is, okay, why it cannot be forecasted for maybe next six months? Forget about six months, next two months or three months. So what is what is it stopping? So the uh, the thing is the data which is required and the computational power which is required is so high that we can have if you have even for example uh, a simple sample 20 GB. This is my personal experience. I think it's, uh, there is a weather forecasting sap, uh, software WRF which you can deploy it on the uh, the real time supercomputing machines or HPC machines or servers. And this simple 20 GB sample, 20 GB of data can run for maybe a couple of days to churn out the sample results. So if you take a real time data, then it will be, you know, it takes a lot of computing power to actually come to a prediction and come and make a, you know, uh, the uh, weather forecasting. So probably that is one of the, this is one of the reason why uh, we can get forecast maybe 15 days or accurately. So we can forecast maybe six months, but that accuracy will be less. Uh, so I mean, this is the uh, significance importance. I just I mentioned only weather forecasting. There are n number of applications, uh, including, so for example, drug discovery or um, the uh, the uh, nuclear you know research. It can be any kind of uh, or the molecular dynamics or the computational fluid uh, flow. All this requires huge amount of computation power, and that is catered by using supercomputing. So we will try to understand how supercomputing is achieved. So, so in the if you take back, take a step back and see, the computing industry is evolved through various stages. One of the stages where it got accelerated is see, every uh, black cloud has a silver lining. So during the World War, okay. So a lot of investment happened from the government agencies in terms of building machines which can compute, accelerate the computations so that they can uh, do much more I mean, uh, uh, faster calculations and computation which can aid the military in better ways. So most of the, uh, you know, scientific, uh, whatever the uh, applications which are coming out, is because of the uh, the military uh, funding. So one of the uh, prime area is also the computation machines are also uh, you know heavily funded through the military means as part of the defense uh, fundings. So there, so we'll try to understand now how this is evolved in terms of. So generally, what happens here is we have a computing machine. So if you take any computer. So CPU is the, we call it the brain of the machine. And there can be, apart from CPU, there can be, there are many other sub components or sub, uh, you know, uh, chips, which actually does the specialized operations. So for example, we have sound card, so audio processor for sound. Uh, so for processing only dedicated for audio, you have GPU graphics processing unit, which is meant for uh, processing the graphical part and so on and so forth. So there are uh, like network card for network uh, processing. So there are specialized cards. So the main general purpose computing per is heavily per uh, completed or computed on the CPUs only. So any specialized comes, so it goes to other areas. So what happened is so to increase the speed of computations. So the have all the uh, 
added coprocessors. So basically, coprocessors are the kind of a processor like a CPU, but it's a cut down version. But they are meant for so like GPU is one coprocessor uh, meant for graphics. So likewise, you have evolved with so many uh, operations. I mean, so many devices. So on this, so which can accelerate the computation to a specific level. So now comes the vector engines. So there is something called vector engines. So these vector engines uh, are, I think, but they have specialized uh, chips which can do vector computations. Basically, it can perform in parallel multiple operations. So it can have more than one computing block and in a, at the same uh, instant clock cycle, you can get multiple computation performed and uh, results are obtained. So basically, we are trying to parallelize the operation and get the result for the same instance of time. Next comes the multiprocessor. This is also one of the widely popular used where to increase the speed of computation. And there is something called NUMA. So NUMA is called non-uniform memory architecture. This I'll just touch upon this, not going in detail. So generally what happens is you have a CPU uh, in, a, uh, in a, the computer and for that you have an attached memory. So CPU and RAM, basically memory uh, communicates for you know data transfer and program execution constantly. So generally that is if you take a normal desktop, we find one you know CPU uh, chip die. And uh, on that, uh, so there is a couple of RAM slots, and uh, you, so the memory transfer happens back and forth between CPU and the RAM. But if you take the uh, high performance machines, they in a single box, you can have, say, four independent parallel CPU sitting there, and each of them having its own RAM slots. So basically, uh, there are four means there are four different RAM slots available, uh, you know, uh, RAM banks available for each of them, and each of them can communicate with each of the processors. So the problem is here is so each since each of them CPU and G, RAM are fixed to the each other, so the access of all the RAM banks is not uniform. So between see a processor one and processor two if there is a data transfer has to happen between the ramps so the data has to go through the processor the processor one has to read the uh, inform the processor two to get the data from the processor to ram so it's like that so it's called non-uniform memory access so it has advantage and disadvantage advantage is because it is each processor has its own local ram kind of architecture so the data is localized and uh, the speed of computation is increased. But if, you, if the processor of a, you know, a remote processor is trying to access uh, another uh, data from the another RAM, processor RAM, so there has to be a hop between the processor. So this is a, uh, a bottleneck. So this is another architecture. This is widely used even today in all the supercomputing machines. This is one of the uh, models that is uh, popularly used. Okay. So parallel computing. So as I was mentioning, all these are nothing but trying to increase the speed of computation for the given uh, clock cycle. So now uh, what we are trying to do is, so I'll just, uh, uh, so there are, in the previous section, we discussed about various parallel computing. Now the, we'll touch upon something called heterogeneous computing. So. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, I, this is yeah. Okay, uh, just to touch upon the parallel computation. So parallel computation is nothing but simultaneous use of multiple computing resources to solve a computational problem. So the simplest example is uh, if you have uh, one uh, some work to be done in real world. So if you have one person to do the work, so it will take say 10 seconds. So in, instead of that, we can divide the same work into 10 smaller units and give it to 10 people. So all 10 people will solve theoretically. So one person solves 
that one piece of work in one second. So basically, all the 10 people would have solved in one second, in theoretical manner. So that is how, so each person is nothing but a computing block. In this case, so the same similar analogy and methodology is also being applied in the uh, parallel computation world. So the problem is broken into discrete parts that can be solved concurrently uh, on a different CPU or course. So <clears throat> now comes the uh, the uh, problem of the computing blocks. So generally what happens is uh, if you take your smartphone on that, you have a chip. The chip, if you cut open, you'll find maybe eight four cores uh, you know, processor or eight core processor. So basically there are four different computing cores. So on which each of them, you can parallelly deploy four tasks and uh, process and it will compute in parallel. So, um, so if you see that all four processors are identical in nature, so that so all computing block basically the architecture, the uh, the you know instruction everything is homogeneous. So that kind of model. So if you take uh, AMD uh, Ryzen uh, nine or Intel uh, i seven. So whichever the processor, if you cut open, they have a computing cores, maybe eight core processor or 16 core processors, each core are identical to each other. So this kind of architecture is called homogeneous architecture. And this kind of computing is nothing but homogeneous parallel computing. Now, so next comes the heterogeneous. So in the beginning of the session, I had started with an example where the in a typical uh, computer, we have a CPU as a brain of the you know, computing, and there are allied chips, sub sub modules or uh, sub chips, uh, which are specialized. For example, GPU, then audio accelerator, network card, DSPs. Many uh, uh, specialized chips are there meant for specific operation. So, if we take the on the average, so most of the resources are unutilized, all these uh, resources. So uh, the GPU is meant for, you know, some of the high-end gaming GPUs are there, or, uh, or general GPUs are meant for uh, graphics processing. But it is, uh, if you are using just for normal desktop processing and all, it will take very minimal resource utilization. So we are not using the complete, uh, you know, the performance benefit of the GPU which is actually uh, can be provided. So likewise, uh, the audio accelerator network you know, processor. So all these devices, most of the time, may be idle or underutilized. So what can be done for that to extract the performance benefit? So in this case, the general pur computations. So general purpose computations include normal basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. This kind of operation, which are meant specifically predominantly done by the CPU, is now can be transferred or deployed onto these chips, which is available in the uh, specialized chips, uh, which is underutilized. So they can do the work and complete the task and give the results back. So this kind of architecture is called heterogeneous computing. Heterogeneous computing refers to the system that uses more than one kind of processor or core. So uh, basically, GPU is a different architecture, different purpose. Network card is a network chip uh, uh, is a different uh, you know uh, architecture and chip. All these are different. They have a different models. Uh, but since these different models, different architectures can be you know used by the CPU to harness the computation for general purpose computation will result in heterogeneous computing. Because, so this is nothing but heterogeneous computing, but how to do this heterogeneous computing? So heterogeneous computing systems refers to a system more than one kind of processor like GPU, audio accelerator, network processor for acceleration of general purpose computing. By using general heterogeneous computing, the speed of computation can be increased 2x to 300x. So your desktop can become a supercomputer. 
it can give the performance of a supercomputer, normal desktop, provided if we are able to harness it. So we'll see. Try, we'll try to see how this can be done. So there are many um, heterogeneous computing hardware available. So uh, APU accelerated processing unit, uh, which uh, by AMD that is being uh, so you, there is nothing but uh, a, a chip which has a CPU and GPU integrated on the same big silicon die. And one example is AMD Kabini APU. Now pretty much all the Ryzen uh, processor R7, uh, R5, R3, R9, all uh, are integrated uh, GPUs which can be programmed and harnessed for general purpose, purpose computation also. So we'll try to understand what is, okay, in, on the similar lines, whatever, so there are many other companies are there. For example, uh, AMD is doing this. Intel is, uh, have their own uh, uh, product line, which supports uh, the open, uh, the gen heterogeneous computing. Basically, they also support general purpose computing uh, on the GPU. So this kind of general purpose computing on GPU, GPU on GPU is called GP GPU. So Intel supports that. NVIDIA also supports uh, this kind of architecture. And if you take any supercomputer, so all the supercomputers are on the model. There is a CPU for, and there is a array of GPU, which is accelerating the computation speed. So this is a common model. That is for supercomputing. For desktop, it is available. For laptops also, you find Intel, AMD, NVIDIA chips there. Then comes the smartphones. Smartphones also, because it's an ARM-based processor, they also pack a punch in terms of the computation. As we see in the uh, following slides, uh, how the ARM chip also can give some huge computation power. So that we'll try to see in the following slides. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, GP GPU is for general purpose computing uh, on a GPU. So now how this is performed. So if you take a GPU and cut open that, so in, if you take a CPU and cut open, you, you may, if it's a four core, you'll find four different cores on the uh, CPU. On the similar line, if you cut open GPU, there will be hundreds and hundreds of minimum 200 to 400 SIMD blocks, computing blocks on an entry level GPU. That is the level of computation. So if you take four, four cores in CPU, the normal simple uh, entry level GPU can have four, 200 to 400 cores. And high end, simple high end performance, high performance GPUs will pack a punch of 4,000 to uh, 4,000 plus cores on their single uh, GPU die. So that means, and on that, so this uh, this cores are SIMD, uh, SIMD, single instruction multiple data. That means if there are 400 cores or 4,000 cores on a single clock cycle, you can perform one shot, 4,000 operations and uh, 4,000 data single instruction that means you can perform a single operation on 4000 data in one clock cycle you are getting that much results that is one thing and also gpu the one of the speciality of gpu is it support hardware level threads which can you can have a hardware level threads from uh, in the range of 10000 to 20000 hardware level threads being deployed at in parallel that is the huge amount of computation power. So because of this computation capability, all the industry leaders, everybody is supporting this GP GPU through different models uh, or some of them is using OpenSeer. That's, uh, that's called open computing language uh, framework or CUDA framework, CUDA is uh, from the NVIDIA. NVIDIA uh, is a compute unified device architecture, is a NVIDIA uh, proprietary uh, and uh, where you can utilize this framework to program the GPU for doing general purpose computation. And the, similarly, an open CL is an open platform. 
supported by even nvidia also supports this so amd intel uh, arm uh, even apple apple actually owns the you know i think uh, the the uh, i think they gave the, the initially they had this open cld of the uh, open cl uh, uh, so now the cornos group holds the uh, license for this open cl and they drive the uh, the uh, the specification open cl specification so that entire industry has a uniform architecture and the framework uh, to follow on so how this heterogeneous computation happens is, um, so you have a CPU on the right side and a GPU on the left side. So you have an application code. So some of the computation can be sent to GPU. Some of the computation can be sent to the GPU. So this can be de decided at the runtime when the application is data is available and it can just accelerate so if you see here on the right side there are four six cores and in the gpu there are hundreds of cores doing the computation so that is one of the reason why it is giving 2x to 300x performance increase so uh, this i have just explained uh, so you can see the uh, So you can see the uh, computation, uh, sorry, uh, uh, since I had mentioned earlier, uh, so you can have the, uh, an accelerated processing unit, uh, generally this is the term used by AMD, to depict the CPU and GPU on a single die, and which can support this kind of GPU, GPU through OpenCL. So there are uh, different uh, heterogeneous computing uh, softwares. So we are focusing on OpenCL because this is widely popularly used. There is OpenMT, uh, CUDA, and so on and so forth. At, uh, application software, okay. Uh, even the general purpose computation, uh, let, there are basically two types of uh, softwares, uh, if you can classify. One is the business class uh, applications, and the other one is scientific applications. So from business up class application, so from nine, uh, Microsoft Office 2010 onwards, all the uh, Microsoft Office is now GPU accelerated. That's the term we use, which if it is being accelerated or uh, if some of the parts of the application, you know, uh, computation is deployed onto the GPU for the speeding up the process. So Opera browser, WinZip, Adobe, Adobe Acrobat Reader, all these applications, these are the business class application or the general applications that can be utilized. So now we'll try to understand quickly, I understand how the OpenCL platform model works and how it can be utilized. So generally what happens is the host here is the CPU generally and
Dr. Raghavendra, you are not audible. Can you share again? Dr. Raghavendra, you are not audible. And your slides are also gone. Did you stop sharing? Okay. Audience, he will join again. There was a network drop there, so please have a patience. Uh, I hope I'm audible now, sir. Yes, you are audible. Actually, what happened? Uh, sorry, the network got suddenly become zero. Network, uh, uh, there was a sudden network drop. And, no, but how uh, come your, your video was coming, only your audio gone? <laughs> I don't know, sir. Uh, when <laughs> I saw that, when I saw that, uh, that there was uh, zero, maybe that yeah. was, it had buffered or something. Oh, yes, that could be. So, yeah, maybe. Uh, you try your slides again. Yes, yes. Yeah, make it fully screen. Okay. Please so, continue. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, continuing from the point. Uh, so basically, the host acts as the master, and the other sub devices acts like a co-processors. So master will decide the divide, uh, take the data, divides into chunks, and provides to the co-processors. So the compute device, in this case, uh, the core processor can be GPU, network cards, and so many things, which is uh, available at that point. So it will take the uh, data. Uh, this, these are the compute devices. So these compute devices will do the computations and give the results back. And the host will combine and give the results to the application. So that is how the model is. So this model is same from supercomputer till smartphones. So this is the hardware, uh, you know, the depiction, and this is the uh, the memory model. So the memory model is like this. So the compute generally what happens is if you take the real world example of the processor, microprocessor. So in that you have cores. So cores will have uh, the cache memories 
level uh, level one, level two, level three cache, and uh, there is a RAM. So on the similar lines, uh, you can find it here. Uh, so this is a compute device memory. So this can be a RAM. It can have global. It is. It can be a global memory or a constant memory. So there can be a global within the device. This is the device. For example, this is a GPU. So GPU can have its own memory, GPU RAM, and along with that, so GPU can have sub computing blocks, and each of the computing blocks can say compute one unit, compute unit two unit like M. So each can have its own, you know, private memory and a processing element. So in this case, private memory is the uh, like a cache memory. So this is the generic the device architecture with memory scopes. So here also the cache line of organization and the you know, main memory kind of organization is still maintained. So now comes the how the process and the uh, memory are interlinked. So here the host memory, here host memory is nothing but the CPU memory, the RAM, and the uh, compute device basically has the so what we say for example in this case is a gpu is a compute device where we want to harness the computing uh, the uh, accurate the computation using this uh, so that gp this memory is the uh, the gpu ram and now uh, the generally what happens is uh, in cpu world we call it as a threads so one process is divided into multiple sub threads and each thread can be deployed on different different cores so here, uh, instead of threads, uh, here it is called a work group and a work item. So work group can be, say, more than one work item. So work item is nothing but a single thread. So you can have multiple thread grouped under one work group. And that one work group is deployed for that one compute element. So here you can find so work item having its own uh, private memory and that is shared by a local memory and the work group is, uh, is mapped into this so now the one of the interesting point about this is so this model you can have generally what happens is if you have done a programming in c array so you, if you have uh, say say hello world so for processing h e l l o we can write individual threads and Oh, it's not. Is it audible, sir? Okay. So, in uh, we we can take individual threads and process individual character in Hello World. So that is like a one-dimensional thread. The beauty of this is you can have one-dimensional thread, basically one-dimensional work item, two-dimensional or three-dimensional. So in so you can have at any given instance three dimensional, you know, thousands of three dimensional parallel threads scheduled and deployed and working on the common problem to solve. So this is, so which is a very unique by itself. So how this program structure works is, so OpenCL program structure is, so since we have this model, one is one side is, if you take this as example, here, this is a host is a CPU. And these are the compute devices are the uh, different accelerator devices. So, so host will run one kind of program that's called host program and uh, small, small programs that is deployed on the, uh, the accelerators are called kernels. They're called the kernels because there are very tiny programs and uh, which can execute in a very short time and compute very fast and give the results so the host program is since it's a master so it should control how what where data should go how the data should be divided how many threads should be spawned uh, which compute device because in the same uh, you know cpu box uh, you can the processor uh, so you can have uh, there can be two gpus or one accelerator all of them are opencl compliant so processor can have you know deploy divide this chunk of uh, data on all of them so that kind of programming has to be done by us through the open serial programming architecture structure the host program i try to identify how many devices are there compute devices it will create a kind of a context for each of them and it will create a memory object for that 
and it will compile and create a kernel programs object and then deploy it to the put into the command queue and command queue of what so each each processing element can have a command queue so processor will host will uh, trans initiate the uh, divide the work assign it in the command queue the program the program when it is in the command queue it automatically starts executing once the data is you know computation happens the result is obtained and it puts back to the host so and there is a synchronize because what happens is the synchronization becomes a you know key aspect because uh, there are thousands of parallel work items that is being deployed in one shot so it is very uh, important to maintain the the data consistency when you have de de divided and uh, deployed a chunks of data uh, in, uh, in thousands of work items so some item work item may fi finish faster some maybe because of various uh, delay factors or uh, latencies in uh, cache and other stuff so it there can be a slight delay so there has a check po checkpoint so that all of the data are obtained there's a wait point or a checkpoint to synchronize so all the data items has to come back processed then it goes further so to how to do this kind of uh, programming is so they provide uh, open cl apis basically so these apis you can you know use to uh, run through that get platform ids uh, what is the platform uh, you know available uh, information related to the compute devices what is the capability of that open cl platform create you know you are, so to create a context so to, basically what we are trying to do is to query the compute device create a context create memory objects compile and link so all this has to be done programmatically and this is the set of apis provided by the open cell uh, you know specification so basically they this is uh, 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 so using this uh, say create context uh, create uh, build program get device information release program release uh, release context so all this apis are used by the the host side programming which runs on the cpu to you know uh, control the and data movement control the program execution on the the accelerator so that is just a, you know the how the working internals working of it so uh, to take a sample results uh, this is opencl is not as i mentioned opencl or the gp gpu is from supercomputing then the hpc servers hpc workstations then you have i perform uh, then you have desktops laptops then embedded uh, so this is one of the results from the embedded uh, unit uh, then uh, we'll take up the smartphone later so in this is one example so here uh, uh, this is a runtime uh, uh, processing uh, how much time you know uh, it is taken to process this information if you are running there's a 100 frames there's a computation related to 100 frames uh, with uh, 32 bit rgb uh, of size uh, 2016 into 1512 each frame so if we are trying to uh, process uh, the devices frames for devices 100 execution time is is around 864 seconds if we are just running on cpu average time is per frame is 8.6 minimum per is 6.98 our maximum is 10.94. If you take the same thing on GPU, so the same data, now you can see that it has reduced to just 2.4 seconds per frame. And totally it takes 240 seconds and roughly uh, 2.3 to 2.49 uh, the minimum maximum. We can do a load balancing also. This is another interesting part in the GP GPU. It's not that, uh, uh, I want to take you to the back side just for a uh, See, the host I always kept on saying that this is the 
CPU and all the compute devices are the accelerators. It is also a case where the host can become also the compute device. So that means open CL all programs can also be deployed on the host itself. That is CPU. So there you can do a kind of a load balancing. So if you are able to do load balancing, then uh, you can see that um, the roughly uh, the computation speed uh, for the combined uh, this thing is uh, uh, on the average you get 2.5. So on the CPU it is taking 19 seconds, 2.3 seconds, and uh, on the average frame is 12.5 seconds. But on the GPU it is now taking. Um, so basically what is happening is on the CPU it has been processed 19 frames and GPU it is processed 81 frames. So to process that on the average it has taken 2.5 seconds. So that is also possible uh, in terms of combining and doing load balancing. This is also possible. So I'll take one of the uh, current uh, example, the Frontier supercomputer right now, which is in, this is HP uh, Cray CX235A. This is the number one supercomputing right now in the world. So if you see here, uh, it uses third generation Epic 64 core uh, processors. Uh, which is around, it has around 5,91,872 CPU cores, okay, uh, which is supported by the Instinct MI250X AMD graphics processor, which has 220 of them with this many cores. So, and also, this is the, uh, and also you can find that there is another one, HPC. Uh, see, there are, if you take any of the uh, supercomputing, just I listed at the first one, top one, uh, and uh, somebody who's working on the, the HPC domain, with the, uh, which has a, its CPU which with for AI related and HPC. So, every supercomputing has a GP, GPU or a, co-accelerator, which does the increase of the performance acceleration. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we'll see the, uh, so we just saw that, see, this is embedded, fine. This is uh, the supercomputing, fine. Now comes the open CL on the mobile devices. Probably you can check now also. You can open your, uh, uh, if you have an Android phone, you can open the, uh, uh, Play Store, you can download an app, OpenCLZ, and uh, this is a benchmarking app. It can tell you the computing capabilities of your, uh, uh, this thing, the OpenCL, uh, what OpenCL platform is supported. So the GPU in this case is Qualcomm Arduino uh, GPU. And this is the list of, so this is the app, if you install, you can, if you install OpenCLZ, then it can detect all the open seal capabilities of this, of your phone, smartphone. And so and list it out. It all list out a complete specification of open seal. So this is the benchmark of the Qualcomm Arduino uh, that is being run. Okay. This is for floating point operations. As I was mentioning, there are two kinds of applications. One is business class application and the other one is the scientific applications. The business class applications are pretty much integer type of computations, integers. Okay, so like financials and other, most of them are integer type of computation. But if you take the scientific computation, uh, the, like weather forecasting or, you know, molecular dynamics, uh, genetic research, uh, or even uh, the, the, uh, uh, the deep space, uh, space exploration, all of them are floating point in nature. The floating, uh, uh, all the data which is dealt is at a very high precision, high you know, floating point computations. So if you see here, this is uh, the floating point result, float V1. Here you can see it is giving a gigaflops of computation. So your phone also packs a gigaflops of computation in the GPU. So what you can do is if uh, now most of the application, they also try to accelerate using GPU. Uh, so they have the GPU libraries, uh, sorry, OpenCL libraries are there. 
So when they are programming all the apps, so apart from which runs on CPU, some of the apps also utilizes GPU for execution. So uh, the simple phone. So this is a data from the Motorola uh, uh, G60. So this is uh, and uh, it, so this has this much uh, computation capability for your float, and this is the computation for the integer for the same. So you can also check the uh, benchmarking. So it will give the performance uh, results. It runs a synthetic benchmark and gives the results. Areas of application. Now, so there are, so this comes to the point where uh, drug discovery, genetic sequence, weather forecasting, molecular dynamics, oil and natural gas exploration, physics, simulations, deep space, uh, big genetics, uh, AI and ML, image processing and facial recognition. If you see this now in the research, everywhere this computation, you require computation speed. I'll give one example for each of them. Drug discovery. So during the COVID time, so every pharma company were in the race to find a vaccine. The problem is to do a realistic, you know, field test or a you know, uh, even before going to a field test, to do actual, you know, getting the uh, the, the chemical compounds and the you know uh, biomolecular compounds and do a laboratory experiments is very expensive, very expensive. Uh, so initially, they can do a simulation of biomolecular interaction. There are so uh, there is something called molecular protein. Uh, then NW came for chemical simulation. There are N roots, amber, there are a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, softwares, open source softwares are available that can be utilized and, you know, simulate, but you require computation power. So you require to use uh, the GP, GPU or OpenCL or accelerated computing. So all these applications are actually, so you have to, uh, when uh, somebody takes up the application to in their field of area, to you know, simulate. If they can check, generally what happens is uh, the application for a scientific application. Uh, if it is not enabled, you can enable the you know GP GPU computation. So the results you will get the faster results, and uh, you know that is that is how you can. There are two things happens. One is you get a faster result. Other thing is the cost of because of simulating without doing actual you know physical experiments, physical. So that will reduce the cost of research. So these are the two aspects uh, that is that drives the, you know, uh, the cost of doing physical experimental research is way high than procuring, a, a, you know, HPC machine and running a simulation. You can run a simulation hundreds and thousands of time. But if you want to do a hundreds and thousands of time physical laboratory experiment, it in crores of rupees or millions of dollars. So that is so. This is where the supercomputing actually uh, pitches in, and also uh, AI and ML machine learning AI. So pretty much everywhere that is being uh, applied and deployed, uh, you name a area, everywhere this is being right now worked on. To accelerate that, you require so GPU is uh, being used as the accelerator for the AI models, deploying AI models or machine learning models to increase the speed of computation. Okay, the, this is the final takeaway is, so as a researcher or a organization, any organization, whether it's a, uh, you know, academic or a research, privately research or a government research or a industry or a individual doing in a, sitting at the home, I mean, in a you know a small space and doing a research, they if they are doing any you know scientific related research, which requires quantitative analysis, and which requires later on physical experimentation, so it is better to have procure an a machine and a software. They can plan it. Instead of okay, the cost of this you know HPC machines are way high, so they can even you know, now the this HPC uh, cloud is there, so they can uh, you know uh, on a rental basis they can take it 
and uh, even those clouds are gpu aggregated when you are procuring the you know the resources for a cloud resource for a month or two months or till your research gets complete so you can decide how many cpu cores you want how many gpu cores you want what is the ram what is the gpu ram everything you can you know specify and uh, you can utilize the you know computation capability and deploy your own software there so this will help in one speeding up the resource uh, sorry uh, research speeding up the research so uh, so this is the final takeaway this is what i have from my side so only thing is uh, how can be done so we have to actively proactively before jumping into the physical experimentation we can do cleverly the simulations first then go for actual experimentation that will you know will streamline the process of research and which will help in a better uh, so yeah so these are the references this is a q and a so any questions or anything anybody uh, thank you dr raghavan swami a uh, yeah. really yeah. insightful talk for the concern so may i ask any participants please uh, unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and please ask a question okay. any questions from any participants these contents are uh, available for us to use Uh, can you introduce yourself ak i am ak singh here mm -hmm. okay so i just wanted to check whether this content presented by him is it uh, downloadable or is it can be shared yeah it is uh, it is available sir uh, see it is uh, you know this video recording would be you know you can always see it back go to youtube our channel this is going to be live and this will be saved so you can always check there all right that is all thank you okay. and also there are uh, there is a corners group if you are really interested in open cell you can just explore that corner in the, in the reference section i have mentioned it the website so you can just go there and okay thank you any other questions from any participants kishor giridhar ram sri krishna geeta any any question piyush okay uh thank you dr raghavendra i think we can yeah is, is there any question from anybody i have a question yeah please which program language this is to program gp gpu for graphics computing you know so your voice is breaking so you repeat again which program language is used to program gp gpu for graphics sir, computing okay sir uh, generally what happens here is the open cl is a open computing language so what they have done is so uh, if you if uh, can i take it to you to the slide okay yeah so if you uh, see this slide so there are two parts of this the host program and the kernel program so host program can be most of the time it is a c++ kind of program so that will run where it is meant for deploying running the you know invoking the uh, uh, the open cl apis which controls the uh, and coordinates for the data exchange and the deployment of the program execution and all so that is uh, in the host that is nothing but it runs on the cpu but coming to the the open G, uh, cl so that is also an open cl part of it but the actual acceleration part which actually executes and go the small tweak that's called a kernel so that which goes and deploys on the uh, the target executing uh, uh, say maybe gpu 
so that generally is a c program that is that is also a cut down version of c programming uh, the reason being uh, cut, why i am saying cut down version of c programming is because uh, generally cpu has uh, been designed with so many capabilities under on which the c programming language has been evolved but if you see the gpu gpu itself is a different architecture but no doubt it gives a complete you know more computing cores in for the general purpose computation but you cannot deploy all the features what cpu does on the gpu so it is a cut down version of a c programming c99 standards so now uh, c++ some of the features of so for example pointer access and other stuff also been added as we speak so you can uh, uh, deploy a program from the cpu to the gpu that was the case when the initial open cell came into picture but because of the hardware capabilities and improvement uh, so now gpu is no, now cpu is no longer just a master even gpu can be a master and it can also deploy the work back to the cpu so cpu and gpu are at the same level and they can independently run c programs uh, in tandem to solve the this thing so uh, now the interesting part is some of the c++ features are also getting in so that is an you know ongoing work but to answer your query or uh, the question uh, cut down c99 standards evolved into a little bit advanced version of c now uh, c++ features also are getting deployed i hope this uh, answers your query and <clears throat> thank you bala murugan any other question from anybody any other questions uh, all right uh, thank you dr raghavan swami for for your time thank you thank and, you you know sharing some useful information and the work you are working and uh, i think we can uh, now conclude the session because i can't i don't see any any further question from anybody else so thank okay. thank you once again thank you thank you sir thank you for your you know providing this uh, platform and uh, opportunity and the space to share uh, the this information uh, so that it can reach a wider wider range of audience so they can benefit in the longer term